be a marketing doctor and get to the heart of any marketing problem. In this presentation, you will find out how to use a 21st century marketing stethoscope and a diagnostic process to tackle any marketing problem. Another title for this presentation could be a paradigm shift from the four Ps to the 48 Ps of marketing. In this presentation, we will first tackle the why a stethoscope is useful. We will go back to the marketing mix or the four Ps. There's also the seven Ps or the extended marketing mix used for service and online marketing. We propose that there are four dimensions to using the marketing stethoscope. The first dimension is involves the 22 piece. The second dimension goes in depth to positioning or the positioning x-ray. The third dimension is getting the pulse. The fourth dimension is a prescription to use. And lastly, how to use this model, this process and its limitations. So first, why is the stethoscope useful? It's useful because it provides a structured process for thinking and analysis that allows quick diagnosis as basis for action. The stethoscope is actually used in many industries. Doctors using stethoscopes for economies, their stethoscopes are GDP, inflation, and other economic numbers. Electricians use test meters and in general, marketing, marketers look at the four Ps and the unique selling proposition. However, that is very limited as far as what it can provide. Now, what's the advantage or the pros of using diagnostic tools like a stethoscope and x-ray versus say a surgery? Well, the pros are diagnostics are quick, they're painless, non-invasive, non-destructive, they are affordable, and they are able to suggest the next action. On the other hand, while surgery is very comprehensive, um, diagnostics may not reveal everything. Now let's go to the four piece of the marketing mix. For sure, you have heard about this before, the product, promotion, price, and place. Uh, it's good to remember that when we say product, we actually refer to variety, quality, design, feature, brand name, packaging, sizes, services, warranties, returns, and so on with the other piece. There's not just the four piece, they mean so much more. Then there was the seven piece. It's not commonly known, but it's called also the extended marketing mix. So aside from the four piece, um, the argument was there are three additional pieces which are very important, which are people, process, and physical evidence. Some representations of the models are like this. It's the seven piece model. Other representations show this. No? like even the seven dwarves of uh, Snow White was used an analogy. And frequently, the extended marketing mix is, used, is useful for online marketing, where uh, again, people, process, and physical evidence are as important as the original four piece. And they are also very important in service marketing. Now you may ask, why are people, process, and physical evidence important for services? Well, services have this characteristic, which we can use the abbreviation VIP int. What is VIP int for services? Well, services are variable. Uh, they change over time. They are inseparable. They are, uh, the service is produced and consumed at the same time. The third characteristic of service is it's perish perishable. It can't be stored and you can put uh, into storage, produce more now to cope with demand fluctuations. 
So what you produce, you consume right away. And lastly, the int is it's intangible. You know, intangibility is related to the sense of sight, sound, um, smell, anything that the senses can, can detect are tangible, but services are not. Okay, so a common example of service is um, a haircut. Okay, so a haircut is variable because it depends on not just the person, the barber doing it, but when he's doing it, he may not produce the same output, um, even if it's the same barber and the same customer. So it's very variable. The production of the haircut is at the same time as its consumption. Again, you cannot store more haircuts now so that you can take away uh, when demand is high and intangible. You will see the haircut only after the service has been performed. Next, now we propose four new dimensions to understanding and diagnosing marketing problems. The first dimension refers to the 22 piece of the marketing stethoscope. What's the first P? The first P is the potential or the total market, which refers to everyone interested in your product or service. Okay, this is represented here in the yellow rectangle. And this total market or this potential market consists of customers, competitors, and stakeholders. Thus, this includes everyone, including future direct and indirect stakeholders. For example, uh, of indirect competitor, a movie showing on the cinema it's not just competing with other movies, it's competing with ball games, it's competing with Netflix, it's competing with concerts. So the potential market, again, is composed of the current and future direct and indirect substitutes and competitors. So we start with that. Who is your potential market? And again, this is represented by the yellow rectangle. After understanding who and what is the potential market, the next P is the probable or available market represented by the light blue-green square. This represents everyone with interest, access, income, and qualification to avail of the product. And in this discussion, we will um, present uh, all products or services and call them products. So, for example, um, if you've heard of the cervical cancer vaccine, which protects women from cervical cancer, um, while it can be used by all females, the qualification is only females 10 years and above because of the price only those in class AB in cities will have access to use this preventive measure. So again, while the potential market can be all women, the probable market will have only these characteristics. Therefore, the probable market is always a subset or less than the potential market. Now, what is the market size? We should be sure that the market size for the probable or the available market is big enough to matter and small enough to handle. What's the third P? The third P is the primary target market. This is again a subset of the probable market representing which part of it should be targeted by the company. Why select a portion and not go for the entire probable market? Well, it's because the company's resources are limited and it's best to focus its resources on the primary target market. What's the next P? 
The fourth P is the penetrated market. These are the customers who actually buy. And in this representation, you will find that the penetrated market is not exactly the same as the primary target market. There are some who are penetrated who, or who buy but were not targeted and vice versa. There are a lot who were targeted who don't actually buy. So the ideal is a greater overlap. And the greater the overlap between the PTM and the penetrated market, the greater the overlap means better marketing efficiency. The fifth P is what we call positioning. Okay? The positioning is the communication that is um, made available to the primary target market and to the penetrated market. When the communication comes from the company, this is what we call brand identity. How the customer remembers the communication is what we call brand image. And again, similar to the primary and penetrated market analogy, the greater the overlap between the brand identity and the brand image, the better the marketing communication efficiency is. Now, one example of identity versus image is, um, if you recall, um, Sun Cellular, the third cell phone company, actually came in as a third telco company, came after Globe and Smart. And both Globe and Smart then was very well established. So Sun Cellular came with a brand identity or a communication saying, hey, we're cheapest. You can do only call from, uh, from this time to this time. Unfortunately, when it started, uh, there were very few Sun Cellular users. But because their offering was very different and very tempting to, to a large part of the population, instead of getting the brand identity Sun was communicating to its customers, the brand image that came about was Sun was the best second phone. Customers had a Sun SIM card in addition to either Smart or Globe. So here there's a difference between brand identity and brand image. Now the six to ninth P are the four P's which support the positioning to the primary target market. The better the alignment and the stronger the four P's, the stronger the positioning. What's often called the fifth P after these four traditional P's is packaging. And in some goods, packaging can provide a very clear competitive advantage, especially those where the packages serve as the shelf advertisement of the product, especially in supermarkets and in retail outlets. The packaging may improve and integrate the delivery of the four P's. So for instance, a perfume bottle looks very expensive, but it protects the perfume scent from coming out. It projects the high end value of the perfume. And it also identifies the, the brand very well. So again, in some applications, packaging is a very important P. Now, more and more, the 11th P of participation has become a very strong point, strong P to strengthen the position. Participation happens when customers are engaged and become co-creators of the positioning and the four Ps. The greater the customer participation, the stronger the customer loyalty. Where do we see such customer participation? Well, we see it a lot. 
If you can imagine the text votes in contests like American Idol, Talentadong Pinoy, Miss Universe, the text votes from customers have a real impact on the winner's selection for this contest. This was also seen in uh, shows like Eat Bulaga, where a large portion of the show is from output by contestants and audience members. So can you imagine another platform aside from contests where customer participation is strong? Well, we do it every day because customers uploading content in YouTube and Facebook are actually participating and become co-creators in the platform. Imagine Facebook and YouTube where the platform dictated the content. That would be a very poor participation model. Okay? Facebook and YouTube are very, very well received by its customers because it's the customers, customers themselves creating the content. And thus, the customers define the four P's of YouTube and Facebook. A warning though, a company should balance participation and they cannot hand over 100% control to its customers. 100% participation can destroy products. In what way? Well, if not regulated, Miss Philippines will always win Miss Universe. Why? Because text votes or online votes will always win. If YouTube did not regulate or limit participation, then X videos will overwhelm it. You, Facebook, which is happening now, will have bullying and fake news um, overriding real content. And Twitter will have 300 character messages. Now, the 12th, 13th, and 14th piece are like the foundations that support the four P's. People, process, physical evidence, which are the extended marketing mix, support the traditional four P's. Now, marketing cannot do it alone. It needs the other functions, people or HR, production or operations, finance representing payments to make this a complete business process. Now the 17th P is purpose. Employees need to be driven and guided by the company's vision and mission and that purpose if customers or employees are engaged and passionate about it will guarantee persistent profits for the long term. Now, what's popularly, popularly referred to as the triple bottom line? The first one is profit, where profit is bottom versus the top line, which is revenue. The second, which is also in our model already, is people. But what's the third bottom line? It's actually planet or public. Even if they may seem uninterested in the company's products or services. So where do we see this in this model? So we see people, profits, and now more pro proactive companies are, are, are prioritizing human capital as the second bottom line. And the third and most indicted bottom line is plan planet or public, which is even greater or even bigger than the potential market. Having all this 21 piece, we need to put this into perspective to include the strategic C's of marketing. Okay. Now imagine driving a car, a regular car, and using only the front view mirror not using the side mirror or the back view mirror, can you imagine how fast and safe can you go with just using one mirror? 
That's the same with marketing using only one or two of the three strategic C's. Now, let's recall what are the three strategic C's. We used a heart to remind us that the first side of the heart of the three strategic C's is the customer. The second side is the company who creates, communicates, and delivers value. The third side is competition. And these are the three strategic C's. For customers, we meet needs, wants, and demands. So where do we see this in our marketing stethoscope model? Here is where the three strategic C's are. The company is at the bottom, customers are on top, and competition is on the left. What the company tries to do is to reach the right customers and competition wants to block the company communication and the profits from going to the company. To be able to be better than competition, the company must listen to its customers and react through its four Ps, through its participation, through its overall business delivery. Now, the first 23 Ps in the marketing stethoscopes represent only the first dimension of our diagnostic process. There are four dimensions. The in-depth, which is the x-ray. The pulse, which is about time and internal considerations and a prescription. So we go to the second dimension, which is the positioning x-ray. The second dimension answers the question, what truly determines marketing success? Is it reality? Is it the 14th P, physical evidence? Actually, there's one more, which is even greater than physical evidence, and this is perception. For marketing, what truly determines marketing success is customer perception, because marketing is a battle for the consumer's minds and what the consumer's mind think, whether it's reality or not, wins. So the 22nd P is perception and it represents how our mind sees and remembers the world. The battle for marketing is we want to be perceived in the correct position in the mind, not of everybody, but of our primary target market. So looking in depth to perception, what's important to the customer is customer perceived value. And that is actually the difference of the sum of benefits minus the sum of costs. So what are the benefits that the customer gets from a product? There's obviously functional benefits from using the product or service. There's a personal benefit there's an image, no? like using an iPhone or a Rolex watch. Aside from the functionality, there's an image benefit. So um, you total all the benefits, less all the costs. What's the cost? The cost to procure, the cost of time to get it, the psychological cost. All these costs in total subtracted from the customer benefit represents customer perceived value. And it's not just benefit or just cost, it's the difference between the two. So going deeper into positioning is the perception into the positioning and how we help the customer position the product in their minds is to always try to paint a picture and tell a story. How do we do that? We refer to points of parity how is our product similar to what is already familiar to the customer? So if you call our product a certain category, like say uh, hot dog, and the customer is familiar with the category of hot dog, then he already comes to think of what it might be because of the point of parity. Now the point of parity is the first one just to, for the customer to help position this product in his mind, but more importantly is the point 
of difference. So if you're a hot dog, how different are you from all other hot dogs that the customer can buy? And you sum all these benefits and advantages versus competition in hopefully a relevant and compelling unique selling proposition to the customer that will last through the entire product life cycle, meaning from introduction to growth to maturity and decline. Okay. So you want your positioning in the minds of the customer to highlight relevant points of difference in a compelling, unique selling proposition. Again, going a little deeper, positioning is actually a promise of performance. It's a promise of the brand, of the company, to a certain level of performance that the customer will expect. And delivering on the promise strengthens the position in the customer's mind over time. And vice versa, failure to deliver on the promise destroys the positioning instantly and sometimes irreversibly. Okay, so if you promise, if Jollibee promises safe, hot, and edible food, and somebody dies of food poisoning, then the undelivered promise can destroy the positioning for a long time. The third dimension for the marketing stethoscope is what we call the pulse. Okay, you take the pulse of a person to determine the number of heartbeats, the intensity of the heartbeats, and the timing. And this is also true for marketing, where we look at the period or the timing as far as when does marketing happen versus sales. Marketing happens before the sale, during the sale, and after the sale. So marketing is a continuous process that doesn't stop. And when planning, we must consider for plans the past, the present, and the projected future. What other things should we still consider as far as the pulse of marketing is concerned? Obviously, we're doing it in the Philippines, and we have to remember that the Filipino is poor. 85% of our population is in the socioeconomic class DE. But even if the Filipino is poor, he's very patient and he perseveres and is very resilient in times of crisis and difficulties. Other characteristics of the Filipino is Puso. You might think of Channel 7, Familia. And you think of channel two and pananampalataya or faith. And this is what makes Philippines and Filipinos different from many other markets. Having considered this 44 piece, what's the outcome of the diagnostics? Okay. After going through all of this, we still need to plan, prepare for the worst, and what we've experienced as the worst so far affecting all markets and all industries is the pandemic. Okay? So we plan, we hope for the best, but we prepare for the worst. And if the worst happens, then we need to pivot and adjust how we do things. Pivot means changing directions, restructuring, reorganizing, going out of the box and thinking of new ways to again be providing a compelling value proposition to our customers. Now the 48-piece marketing stethoscope and diagnostic process is just one approach to marketing analysis. Because it's simple, it's easy to master and apply, but its simplicity also carries with it inherent limitations. We can actually have other models such as this, but it's so hard to remember because there's no story behind it. So as a final note, I recommend students and marketing professionals to consider using this 48P marketing stethoscope and diagnostic toolkit as an easy to remember, quick, valid, and useful tool for marketing and business analysis. It doesn't work all of the time, but it works most of the time. So, in summary, we know why the stethoscope is useful because it's quick 
and it provides a good basis for action. We know the history from the four Ps of the marketing mix to the extended marketing mix of the seven Ps. We reviewed the first dimension of the shift to the 22 Ps stethoscope. We went in depth to the positioning X-ray. We took the pulse as far as period of time in the Philippine psyche. The fourth dimension is the prescription on what to do and what are the limits of this model. So in total, you can now consider your, to be yourself to be a marketing doctor who can use a marketing stethoscope to go get to the heart of any marketing problem. And one more thing, if you found value in this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, connect through my blog or through LinkedIn, so together we can serve.